Amen. The text for today's sermon is taken from the gospel lesson from St. Matthew chapter 14 that was read a few minutes ago, a very familiar story. If you grew up attending Sunday school, I know you heard this story over and over again, Jesus walking on the water and calling Peter to come to him. In the name of Jesus Christ, your people of God. I really love this story from Christianity Today, the Christian magazine that came out several years ago. Seems like Jerry Hill, a a Baptist pastor, tells about a friend of his serving a mission in Alaska. The water there was so bad in this particular Alaskan community that a thick red scum would appear on the top of any standing water. Now, this little mission congregation was in the process of building a new church building. And since it was a Baptist church, there was a baptistry, that's a small pool in the sanctuary, normally behind the altar, or what they would call an altar, is where the baptisms would take place. That had been installed, and it was being used, even though the building was not totally ready. On this particular occasion, the baptistry had been filled, and the red scum, of course, had appeared on top of the water. It would be skimmed off before the Sunday morning services. And the building inspector happened to show up on that Friday before the services to inspect what had been done. And he called out to the pastor, what's this red rug doing here as he stepped on the red scrum? And immediately, you can guess what happened. He did not walk on water, let me assure you of that. He went out of sight in the baptistry. And that is a true story. How many here can walk on water? Let's be honest, ordinary people can't. Now, a true blue sports fan might argue with that. When Rita and I lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, just off the campus of the University of Alabama, where I was a town gown pastor many years ago, not only did many people think Bear Bryan walked on water, there were some who swore they had seen him do it. General George Patton's soldiers, the great general of World War II, they were in total awe of him. And a member of General Marshall's staff once asked a second lieutenant under Patton's command if he believed that General Patton could walk on water. Lieutenant replied, Colonel, I know this. If General Patton had to walk on water, he would figure out a way to do it, and within 24 hours, he would have me doing it also. Such stories are part of our national folklore, but they're all in fun. Nobody takes them seriously because, let's face it, nobody can walk on water, at least ordinary people. And that's exactly the point of today's gospel lesson from St. Matthew's Gospel. Jesus was no ordinary man. And the effect that he had on the lives of those who put their trust in him is dramatic. Jesus shows himself again for who he is. He is Emmanuel, God with us set into the world by our Heavenly Father to be our only Savior. This is a remarkable miracle in today's text. But our Lord's greatest achievement was when he came into this world to take your place and my place upon the cross of Calvary, to pay for our sins there, every last one of them, to die that we would not have to die eternally and to rise again that we also might have new eternal life in his name. And this Jesus still comes to us today as we are buffeted by the waves and storms of everyday living. He comes to us when we're feeling troubled and helpless. Our Savior did not leave us helpless and alone. Remember, as you study the scriptures, he promised his disciples that he would send his Holy Spirit, which he did at Pentecost, and empowered by the Spirit through his word, by our baptism, as we feast upon Jesus in the Lord's Supper, he is present in our lives, leading us, guiding us, strengthening us, empowering us, molding us. And we, still in our sinful selfishness and sins, we still fall 
prey to fear. Fear is a terrible thing. And sometimes it is so very subtle. In his book, Common Table, John Cowan tells about a young priest who took a, over the temporary responsibilities for a, an affluent Episcopal church in the state of Minnesota. He was puzzled by the church meeting, so. On the surface, all was well, all was well, a perfectly fine group of well-to-do people doing their best for the best of God's kingdom. But he had this feeling inside of himself, pastors get these, by the way, that something was going on that he just didn't understand. And unable to bear the ambiguity any longer, he asked an older priest who was familiar with this parish what he was sensing but he could not name. And the older priest replied, try the word fear. That was it. Everything made sense if he took as his basic assumption that most of these folks were afraid, afraid of what might happen to their lives. Sure, they were well-to-do. They were presidents of this and vice presidents of that, leading politicians, income-producing brokers, insurance agents, restaurateurs. They owned expensive homes with pools, club memberships, condominiums in Aspen, and homes in Florida. And they were afraid because they lived life on the edge. One mistake. One change in management, one recessionary cycle, and the paycheck that supported all that wealth could easily slip away, sending them tumbling down a financial cliff and causing them to lose their lifestyle, and along with that, their right to belong to this community of friends. Frayed collars and secondhand dresses weren't really appreciated at this church. Fear is a terrible thing. Even before the horror of 9-11, the American Kennel Club confirmed that fear was becoming more pervasive all the time. Yes, you heard me right. I said the American Kennel Club. According to their records, in 1975, cuddly poodles were the most popular purebred dog in America with over 140,000 registered. And in 1975, there were only 952 registered Rottweilers, a fierce breed often used as a guard dog. But by the year 2000, the poodle population had been cut in half, while the Rottweilers had increased 100 times to over 102,000. I guess we could say that not only is America going to the dogs, but big, strong dogs at that. How many people today are fearful people, even Christians? We fear crime. We fear losing our job. We fear terrorist attack. We fear war and disease and dementia. We fear illegal aliens. We fear, and you could fill in the blank a hundred times, how we need the reassurance that comes from knowing that in all those times when our heart's in trouble and we feel most helpless, that Christ comes to us powerfully. Jesus comes across the troubled waters of our lives and says to us, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he beckons us. He beckons us to leave the security of the boat to leave behind our security blankets and to go with him to actually walk on water, to trust him and use his power to overcome our fears. How easy it is to sit in our beautiful church and to make fun of that disciple Peter, but at least brave if foolish Peter got out of the boat and was willing to walk on the water, and even though his trust failed him as he came to Jesus, yet, as always, God was there to lift him up. The God who created us, the God who redeemed us, the God who sustains us in all circumstances. In his book, A Second Helping of Chicken Soup for the Soul, Bill Soares writes of a young neighbor named Nikki who learned to trust in Jesus no matter what. You see, when Nikki was in seventh grade, she was diagnosed with leukemia. 
She went through all the necessary chemotherapy and, of course, the resulting hair loss. Anybody here who has had teenagers knows that to be different as a seventh grader is a special kind of death. And without hair, Nikki was very different from her peers. She had been a generally popular girl, but she still faced numerous hurdles. Kids would sneak up behind her and snatch her wig off. People would stop and laugh. No one would sit with her in the cafeteria or in her classes, and the lockers on each side of hers had been vacated. Nikki said she could handle losing her hair. And with her faith in Jesus as her only Savior, she could even handle death. But the hardest part of her illness was how her friends acted around her. Nikki's parents had given her permission to stay out of school, but then Nikki changed her mind. She had read a story about a seventh grader in Arkansas who was bullied for bringing his Bible to school. The boy handed his Bible to the biggest tormentor and said, Here, see if you have enough courage to carry this around for one day. Those three bullies became his friends along with fellow members of his church. Nikki set out for school the next Monday. As usual, her parents drove her. When she got to school, Nikki hugged and kissed her parents. Then she said, Mom and Dad, guess what I'm going to do today? Her eyes began to tear up. Today, I'm going to find out who my real friends are. Then Nikki took off her wig and said it on the car seat. They will take me for who I am or they won't take me at all. I don't have much time left. I've got to find out who they are today. Then Nikki asked her parents for prayers and she walked into the school. And not a single person bullied or teased her from that day forward. Brothers and sisters, of what are you afraid? What are your fears in life? Is it going back to school? Are you afraid what the future may bring? Health concerns, family concerns, afraid God can't forgive a sin that lurks in your closet, job fears. Perhaps it's inviting a neighbor or friend to come to worship or Bible study with you. Don't let fear defeat you. Jesus is beside you and says, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. We have a Savior who comes to us in our time of greatest need and says, don't be afraid, I'm with you. Step out of the boat and walk on the water with me. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus, our Savior, for the life he led for each and every one of us, for the death he died that we might not face eternal death, for the eternal life we have through him and his sacrifice and glorious resurrection. But most of all, we ask, Lord, that as your spirit fills our lives daily, that we, by his power, conquer our fears and go forth as your people into the world, knowing that life is not fair, that bad things do happen, but that you are always with us, guiding us, comforting us, strengthening us, all this we ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.